let's begin uh, with lecture two of our course on astronomical data analysis uh, using Python. As I mentioned in my first lecture, uh, from the second lecture onwards, we are going to actually start looking at Python code and uh, we are going to share the notebooks that were used to create this code with you. Uh, these Jupyter notebooks can be opened by you on your local computer and you can feel free to edit them, modify them uh, as you see fit. Uh, so let's get started. I've actually prepared all of these uh, slides uh, using, uh, uh, using uh, Jupyter notebook. Uh, these are aut automatically generated from the notebook itself. And therefore, if we want to change things, play around with uh, things, uh, we'll do that for a few minutes at the end of the class, where I'll demonstrate how a Jupyter notebook works. Uh, so let's get started. In this course, we are assuming that you are new to Python. Uh, so we will start from really the basics. Uh, you may or may not have programming experience in another language. And as I mentioned last time, if you don't have any uh, programming experience at all, I strongly urge you to review uh, the content uh, as we go along, because you may find that I'm going a little bit too fast uh, for your understanding. Uh, I may also uh, end up using a few phrases, words of jargon that you are unfamiliar with. So if you just review it once more, listen to it once more, go through the slides once more, uh, and perhaps uh, use Google to search on concepts that you don't understand. And for particularly difficult to understand concepts, please post questions into the Moodle forums uh, so that we, uh, you can get answers from your uh, fellow participants or from the instructors. Okay, so we start off now with our first program. And this is the first Python program that we are going to write. Uh, it's written here, typed out for you. Uh, we'll go line by line and make sure we, we understand everything. Uh, so the first line says A is equal to three. Uh, so here we have a variable A, uh, which is assigned a value of three. And because three is, Python knows that three is an integer, uh, the variable A is going to be assigned an integer type. Okay, so it's an integer. The variable B is assigned a value of five. And of course, that also is an integer. And we now create a new variable C, which is equal to the sum of the two variables A and B. And since A has a value of three and B has a value of five, uh, variable C is going to have a value of eight. And similarly, we define a variable uh, called D, uh, which is the difference in value between it's basically A minus B, right? And then on the la uh, next line, we have two variables Q and R, uh, which are equal to, again, two expressions on the right-hand side of the equal to sign. Uh, this is actually allowed in Python. You can have multiple comma separated variables on the left assigned uh, progressively to the same number of comma separated uh, expressions on the right. So for example, now here in this line implies Q is equal to A over B and R is equal to A percentage B. We'll come to in a moment what A percentage B means, uh, but uh, this is allowed. The main thing is you could have any number of variables here. So for example, the two lines immediately above this could have been shortened to C comma D is equal to A plus B comma A minus B, right? You could have written it on one line. Now we come to three print statements uh, of our code. The first print statement is a simple string. And as you can see here, the print is a function uh, in Python 3. Uh, so you say print and you have whatever you want to print within, within these curved brackets. So we 
on the first line we simply say hello world and when the line is printed by default a new line gets added so you have a return uh, there by default and then on the next print statement we print some difference equal to something which is a string because it's enclosed in these double quotes and then we print out the values of the variable c and the variable d right because c and d don't have double quotes around them python knows that these should be interpreted as variable names and their values should be printed and uh, that is what it will do and then on the third line we print the quotient and the remainder uh, which we have calculated there so now we know what a percentage b means uh, it means uh, you divide a by b and return whatever is the remainder of that division right so now since a is 3 and b is 5 a percentage b uh, the remainder of that is going to be 3 because the quotient is going to be 0 and the remainder is going to be uh, going to be 3 uh, now let's uh, so if you print out these values what is shown here in the lines below is the output of this program right so the first five lines uh, which sort of assign values to variables they don't create any output but the next three lines because they are print statements are going to produce output so the first line is a simple string it just prints hello world uh, the next uh, uh, line is the sum and difference of the two variables a and b uh sum of course is 8 and the difference is minus 2 and then on the third line we print the quotient and the remainder right so this is a fairly straightforward program but it already allows us to understand a number of things about uh the python language so first thing you realize is that we did not have to declare variables and data types in advance so for example if you are used to programming in any version of fortran or c or c++ uh, you would know that at the start of your program you typically define the types so you would say things like uh, integer a or uh, int a uh, in c integer a in fortran you would uh, uh, define float types character types and so on at the beginning of your program those kind of languages are statically typed which means the variable type is fixed at the beginning and cannot be changed within the program python is not like that it is dynamically typed variables are created whenever first assign values and they don't exist if they are not assigned a value so python is what is called a strong but dynamically typed language the type can change so if we jump back uh a equal to 3 means a is an integer and uh, if i follow that with a new line which says a is equal to 3.0 then a will automatically become a float and this will not be considered an error in python because it's a dynamically typed language the second thing to notice here is that everything after hash uh, after the hash symbol uh, here uh, is uh, ignored is a comment and is ignored so feel free to comment this is very important especially when you are learning to program please write in a comment what you are trying to do because sometimes when you trying to do something and something else is happening it is the comment that will help other people understand what you are trying to do and uh, why it's not working a comment can be on its own line or it can follow a uh, line of code so for example here uh, now let's print is in uh, is a comment on its own on its own line the full line is just a comment but if you see this line here yes this is allowed 
is a comment that is part of a line of code. So there's a line of code, there's a hash. Moment there is a hash, the Python interpreter will ignore all the characters that follow it. So you can have comments on the line or you can have any number of comments on their own lines. The print statement we've encountered, it can be used to print output of any kind. This will be the most commonly used uh, built-in function of Python that we will use. And we will use it frequently because that's going to tell us what the output of your program is. Then we also saw a concept called tuple unpacking assignments. So what that means is you can write a comma b is equal to five comma six. This is just shorthand for a is equal to five and b is equal to six, right? So you just makes it quite clear. Of course, if you have eight variables, uh, please don't write a comma b comma c comma d etc and then assign them to eight values because that becomes very unreadable and prone to error. You may, you may want to assign the fifth variable a value of five, but uh, by mistake, uh, you miss the counting and you assign it a value of six or something else and then spend a long time debugging uh, the problem. Okay, so we also saw the behavior of the slash operator and the percentage operator within, uh, with integer types. Uh, this behavior changed in Python 3. So since we are only learning Python 3 in this course, uh, I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. But if you are used to using Python 2, and those of you who have used Python 2, please go and uh, run this code uh, in Python 2. You will need to change the print expression statements as well. But if you run this code in, in a Python 2 environment, uh, you'll get different answers for division and uh, this remainder operations. Another thing to notice is there are no termination symbols at the end of Python statements. Those of you who are used to C, C++, uh, Java, etc., will uh, notice this, that in, in C, for example, you end a statement by putting a semicolon. In Python, uh, there is no such thing. Uh, there is no need the return uh, key or the enter key uh, puts you on a new line. And once it's on a new line, uh, Python knows that there's nothing more to be done. Uh, you usually have, uh, but you do have a semicolon available in case you want to use it. So for example, in our code, uh, we could have written uh, A equal to three semicolon B equal to five, right? That would have meant assign the value three to A and the value five to B uh, on a single line of code. Again, for readability's sake, you may have assigned two or three variables uh, like this on one line but don't try to stuff things uh, uh, into too much. The reason I say this is because Python is, Python programs are typically uh, several times smaller than the equivalent programs in compiled languages. And therefore you don't have to do that extra bit to save space into your lines of code. You'll have very small number of lines of code anyway. Okay. So now when we run this program, what is actually happening? First of all, there is no explicit compiling and linking step. So again here, those of you who are familiar with compiled languages like C or Fortran will know that you usually compile the code into something known as object code, and then you link it with, with libraries. So for example, you typically want uh, some kind of IO library for input and output. You typically want a math library for all the mathematical functions and so on. In Python, there is no such thing. If you were running this code from a command prompt of your terminal, you would simply type python first.py, where first of the pi dot pi is the name of the file containing the code that we just looked at. 
Internally, that program gets immediately translated into something called byte code. Uh, and that creates, with your first.py, it creates a file called first.pyc. And then the translation and the execution happens in a line by line manner. And this is typical of all interpreted languages uh, like Perl or basic or, or Python, where everything is sort of read line by line and executed. The disadvantage of this approach is that if there is an error in your program, let's say the error is on the n plus one line, the program will happily run and execute the first n lines. Then on the n plus one line, it will encounter an error and the program will stop, okay? And now if you want to run the program again, you have to fix that error on the n plus one line and then rerun your code. This is okay if your, your code is running in, in a few seconds, but suppose you have a very complex code which runs, let's say for three weeks. And then if you have an error on your last line of code, then you'll, you'll have to run it for three weeks again to get your outputs. The, so this is a major disadvantage of any interpreted language, including Python. In a compiled language, errors, syntactical errors, uh, errors in syntax are caught by the compiler. And even before you start running the program, you are forced to fix the errors, the syntactical errors in your program. This doesn't mean that compilers will catch semantic errors. Like for example, if you meant to add two numbers, but by mistake in your code, you are subtracting them, okay? Uh, and that's an error of semantics, an error of meaning. That error will be there in a compiled language as well as a interpreted language. So that way they're the same, but Syntactical errors uh, can cause trouble in, uh, uh, in any interpreted language, including Python. But it allows you to do what is called interactive shell programming. So what that means is if you're, this is particularly useful for data analysis, where you want to do one step at a time. Uh, you want to perhaps visualize or plot some figures as you process your data just to make sure that things are going all right. So that becomes very easy in any interpreted <coughs> language like Python. And that is why Python, that is one of the reasons why Python is such a popular language for uh, interactive data analysis. One must also remember that interpreted language codes are generally slower than the equivalent codes in uh, compiled languages. We will encounter this problem uh, with Python. And therefore we will also look at how Python mitigates uh, these kind of problems by taking critical parts of the code and rewriting them in a compiled language like C. So now we, jump in to the first tour of the various data types. So like in other programming languages, there are integers and there are floats. Uh, these are the two main numerical data types. And we we'll look at briefly at the math module because that's a module that almost everyone ends up using. And then we will look at strings uh, where we will look at how strings are declared and what is the concept of a sequence, what is the concept of slicing of strings, and what is the concept of mutability. And within all, within the context of the study of strings, uh, I will also introduce the uh, uh, object-oriented programming or the object concept of object-oriented programming and the various methods uh, that apply there. Okay, so you can operate on integers directly inside the Python interpreter. 
So star star is the exponentiation operator. So if I do eight star star two, then I'll get a value of, uh, of 64, uh, which gets printed out. Uh, Python is pretty fast with integer uh, calculations. Uh, it, so if I do 23 star star 100, it's 23 raised to 100, it calculates uh, uh, the exact value of that and prints it out. Okay. And then uh, actually does not print out the L. Uh, so this is a bug now because this, uh, it used to print out the long integer type, uh, the indicating uh, L would be put at the end, indicating that this is a long integer type, but in Python three, this does not happen. And so I should, I should probably update that. Uh, then uh, we do five divided by two or five percentage two. And uh, this, is, this just prints the quotient and the remainder of this division. You will immediately realize that Python is a very effective scientific calculator and is effective because you can do all of these calculations uh, in a notebook or on the Python uh, prompt and you can go back and change the numbers, redo them and you can store unlike a regular calculator where probably just the last few calculations are stored in Python, the entire history of your calculation is stored uh, and then you can go back and make changes as needed. Now we look at real numbers or floats uh, as they're called in C. Uh, so if you do 5.0 star two, that returns 10.0. Uh, if you do five star 2.0, that of, of course is 10.0. Uh, and notice here that the values get upgraded to the higher data type automatically. So in, in both of these multiplications, you're trying to multiply a real number with an integer. And the answer of course, in that case is a real number. And uh, uh, the data type of the answer is automatically upgraded to the uh, float type. Uh, exponentiation by a fraction is allowed. So for example, if you want to take a square root, the square root of five, I just do five raised to 0 0.5 and that prints out the square root. Uh, if you divide five divided by 4.0, that of course gives you, again, get, does an upgrade and uh, it tells you what the exact value is. In Python 2, uh, and Python 3, the behavior when you divide uh, uh, a real, uh, an integer by a real number like this is identical. However, it is different if you, uh, uh, if you divide an integer by an integer between Python 2 and Python 3. So then again, we do the remainder operation and you can even do a remainder of a non-integer uh, denominator. So when you do five percentage 4.1, uh, what it should print out for you is exactly 0 0.9 because uh, you divide five by 4.1 and then the remainder is 0 0.9. But you will notice here that there is a four at the end. And that is because when you do a floating point calculation on a computer, uh, it is always a inexact process integer addition, subtractions, et cetera, are exact, but real number operations in Python are not exact. And so you get an answer that is approximately correct. Okay, it's, it's only off by less than one part in a billion, but it's off, right? And that is expected that the, that normally happens. This is not strange behavior. Uh, right. So we've looked at integers and floats. Next, we look at the math module. So in Python, the core Python language is extremely small. It, it is something that can be taught and learned within a few hours. 
but almost everything is in the form of modules and packages okay so a module and in in one or two lectures we are going to see how we can build our own modules but today we'll look at the math module uh, a math module is one of the many built in modules uh, within the python uh, language a module can be thought of as a collection of uh, related functions if you want to use a module in a program you have to type import space the name of the module so if you want to use math module you will do import space math like we've done in this snippet of code to use a function inside a module simply say module name in our case math dot sum function and some input value okay so we have a snippet of code here that demonstrates the use of uh, the math module so we do import math and then we say x is equal to 45 times uh, math dot pi divided by 180 okay and what is that doing for us it's converting the angle 45 degrees which we have in mind into radians so x is the angle 45 degrees in radians right once you do that if you do math dot sign of x uh, that will print out for you the value of uh, sine 45 degrees uh, which is 1 over root 2 and as you are familiar or all familiar it's 0 0.707 something now if you have uh, you can have nested functions one function inside another so instead of explicitly converting uh, uh, 45 degrees into radians there is a function available uh, within the math module called radians which takes a degree value as an input and converts it into radians. So by nesting these functions, we are equal, uh, able to shorten the two lines of code into one. We simply write uh, math.sign, math.radians45, and uh, these are known as nested functions. So this is a simple use of the math module. But the math module itself is fairly large. There are 42 functions inside the math library. So suppose you want to quickly see which functions are available in a module. You use uh, the dir command. There is like a directory. So if I do print dir math, it prints out a list of all the functions that are available in the math module and as uh, we know there are the usual stuff sine will be there square root will be there log will be there log 10 will be there log 2 will be there factorial is there exponent is there and so on there are many many functions that are available uh, uh, all the inverse uh, trigonometric functions are also there right as uh, a sine a cos and so on uh, so you can you can do simple math uh, using the math module now suppose you wanted to know more about a specific function inside the math module uh, you would do something like help in bracket and the name of the function within the module remember you have to type math dot hypot okay you can't just type hypot because you don't uh, python doesn't know what my hypot means but it knows that within the math module there is a function called hypot uh, on which you can get some help so here immediately it tells you that it basically returns uh, the euclidean distance uh, square root of x square plus y square now we move on. So we looked at the num numerical data types. Let us look at the string data types in Python. Right. Now we have 
a the variable a assigned to a string called john's computer and notice that there is a double quote uh, at both ends of the string right and there is a single quote inside now python therefore interprets this as the string delimiters this is the start of the string and this is the this double quote is the end of the string but this single quote which is there inside uh, these double quotes is to be interpreted as an as an apostrophe in this case and it does that correctly so uh, now b is equal to john said this is my computer now we have enclosed double quotes inside the single quotes so you can delimit the start and end of the string either using single quotes or using double quotes in the first line where we said a is equal to john's computer we delim delimited the string by double quotes and on the next line we said the string is a enclosed uh, by single quotes that is also allowed or there is a third option if you want to use only single quotes you can use the backslash as an escape sequence and there it will interpret john's computer exactly in the same way as we have in the first line you can escape uh, both Uh, single quotes as well as double quotes in your strings you can also define what are called long strings and those are enclosed within uh three double quotes on each side between a pair of triple double quotes so here you have this three double quotes and you end that string again with three double quotes and here uh, you can have multiple line uh, statements multiple line strings uh, in your program so suppose you want to print instructions uh, to the user of your program which span several lines you can just put it as a long string and uh, put it there okay now you could also do it by using the backslash n uh, escape sequence those of you who are familiar with c uh, will will know that backslash n uh, corresponds to new line so this will be equivalent to the python statement that we have in the first uh, cell but remember this probably it's better more pythonic way of doing things is to write your things in this fashion rather than trying to write it in in this fashion but output wise they're going to be quite equivalent uh so these kind of strings uh, can be used to dynamically build python scripts both python based and in other languages it's also useful for documenting functions and modules when we talk about functions and modules in a future lecture i will remind you again of these uh, triple uh, quoted strings for multi line uh, comments and descriptions okay so now what kind of arithmetic can we do on strings so in python you can define one string s1 to be hello and another uh, string s2 to be hello world and you can print you can define a third you can define a variable called string sum which is the sum of s1 and s2 uh, in other programming languages this will probably return an error but in python the plus sign here corresponds to what is called the concatenation operator so it basically just sticks the two strings together and prints them out hello world 
remember there is no space between hello and world because in the string itself there is no space so when the two strings are concatenated they are just stuck together to each other without a gap there is also a concept of a string product so you can do s1 multiplied by 3 and what it then does is it interprets that is as you want the string to be multiplied meaning it has to occur three times the string s1 so it's going to print if you print the string product it's going to print it as hello 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 you can also uh, do operations like multiplication and summation at one go okay so you do the string repetition followed by a string concatenation so you have hello 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 three times and word again notice here that you don't have a gap between hello and world if you actually wanted a gap between hello you would need to introduce a space probably here uh, just after the o or you could introduce a space here uh, before the w of world now we come to another concept in python which is the concept of a sequence a sequence is basically a set of objects that are there in bundled together into one thing so for example you can think of this string python rocks as basically the characters p y t h etc all being bundled together into one string in a sequence in python always the first element of a sequence has uh, an index of zero okay so a zero corresponds uh, uh, to the letter capital p uh, and a one corresponds to the small letter y and a2 corresponds to t and so on it is also possible to define a sequence by specifying uh, negative indices and by negative indices one means basically strings are counted uh, characters start to be counted from the end so a minus one corresponds to the last element of the sequence a which is a string the last element of course is this exclamation mark and a minus 2 corresponds to the second last element of the string which is s and a minus 3 corresponds to the letter k because that's the third last element of the string so you basically count backwards is that so then there is a function that is associated with uh, with strings and other objects which is called len so if you have any sequence uh, and you do len len starts for length because it measures the length of both a sequence as well as unordered collections which we will encounter later but if you do len a it returns or prints out 13 and it does that because there are 13 characters in that phrase python rocks including the exclamation mark at the end as well as the space between python and rocks so there are 13 characters there that's why length of a which is a sequence is 13. any sequence can be sliced uh, please pay particular attention to this slide because when we start working with arrays numerical arrays we will use exactly this sort of ideas so a2 colon 6 means that elements with indices 2 3 4 and 5 but not 6 are included right so let's go back to our phrase which is python rocks so here a0 is p a1 is y and a2 is t right and that is why it prints t h o n remember that 
if you are given two colon six, that means element number two is included, but the last element number six is not included. So only two, three, four, five are included. Uh, you, if you subtract this number two from six, that will give you the number four, and that will correspond to the number of elements uh, that you will have in your in your slice. A slice is a substring or a part of a string, and there are various ways of obtaining slices of any sequence. So what is eight colon minus two? What that means is you start with the a eight element. It's not the eighth element. Remember, it's the ninth element because you start counting from zero. Uh, so you start from the ninth element and go up to the second last element, but not including. And there you get the letters O C K from that Python rocks phrase. You can also define a slice like this a colon five. What that means is you by default, if the start of the sequence is not defined, it's assumed to be the first element. And five is, of course, the end element. Uh, so it prints out P Y T H O. So it prints out the first five letters of your string. If you reverse this now, if you do five colon uh, and blank or nothing there, huh? that corresponds to the fact that you want to start with element A5, but you want to go to the end because by default, whatever, if you don't specify what the end of your slice is, it assumes you want to go up to the end of the entire string. Okay, so len A is assumed. And here zero is assumed, and it prints the remaining part of your string. Uh, when uh, this may seem a little bit overwhelming and complicated, but it's not. Once you get the hang of it, you will find that it is extremely straightforward and easy. Nevertheless, I urge you to uh, review uh, uh, these concepts of uh, sequences and how sequences can be sliced. Because in data analysis, this sort of thing will occur again and again. Let's do some crazier slicing. So uh, A1 colon 6 colon 2 means start with element A1, uh, end with uh, the element just before A6, which means A5, and skip colon two means is like a step size. So take every alternate element. By default, colon one is, is assumed, okay? So here you can, uh, you can verify for yourself again with Python rocks that these are all correct. And you have A1, A3, A5. Of course, these are indexes one, three, and five. Uh, which get printed because it'll start with A1, then it'll skip A2 and uh, have A3, then it'll skip A4 and have A5, which is AN, right? Which is printed here for you. And that's why it prints YHN as your slice of the sequence. A colon colon two, what does it do? It says starts with the zeroth element, end with the last element, but the one element before that, and print every alternate, uh, every alternate element of the sequence. So that's what it will print here. A colon colon minus one means start with the uh, first ele uh, element, go up to the last element, but do it in reverse order. So what this will do is basically print the entire string Python rocks in reverse order. If you do something like this, a one comma six minus one, uh, it's equivalent to i comma j, start element and end element, but it reverses the meaning of i and j because of the minus one that you uh, 
uh, that you have over here. Okay, and, uh, that in this case prints out an empty string. Okay, so, so much for strings. The reason we spend time on strings is because they have direct analogs, uh, string slicing as a direct analogs uh, with uh, uh, slicing of uh, lists, dictionaries, also slicing of uh, new NumPy arrays, which we will encounter in the data analysis part. Okay, so now before we go on, uh, I will give you, spend about five minutes giving you a rather oversimplified introduction to the concept of object-oriented programming, okay? You will hear this often in the computer science jargon, so an object can be thought of as a construct in, in memory. It has a well-defined behavior with other objects. So for example, if you have the object two and the object three, which are obviously two integers, you can multiply them together. But if you have strings A and string B, uh, if you try to multiply them together, it makes no sense. So that will return an error. <clears throat> The properties of the object, its attributes, and the operations that can be performed on it are all predefined. Uh, when you define, when you create an object, it comes with its set of properties and the kind of things that you can do with uh, uh, the operations that you can do with it. A method is a function bound to an object that can perform specific operations that the object supports okay so for example let me give you a very simplified uh, version of this so for example uh, if you think of an apple as an object it has certain attributes it has certain properties like its size its color its taste and so on but it also has certain operations that you can make with it okay so you can take an apple and make apple juice with it, or you can make apple pie with it and so on. So the method here for the case of the object apple, the method would, would could be make juice. So apple.make juice would be a method and in apple.make uh, apple pie would be another method. Not all methods are supported for every object. So for example, if you, instead of an apple, you have a banana, right? You cannot make banana pie, out, you can't make apple pie out of it. It makes no sense. Apple pie has to be made from apple. So for a banana, banana may have attributes like color and size and so on, but it wouldn't have an attribute uh, make apple pie with it. So every object, has its own properties and its own methods. Properties are like adjectives which describe the object and methods are like verbs or adverbs that describe what operations that ob uh, object can perform. So for example, if you have two objects, they're both integers, you can add them, subtract them and so on, but there may be certain operations that you can't perform on. So now let us see some, since we have already been introduced to strings, let us see some string methods in action. Uh, so I have a, defined a string in double quotes. I am a string, I am an object, I am immutable. I put it in double quotes, it's a string. And then we have a method for a string, which is called title. And what that does is it basically takes every word of the string and capitalizes the first letter. So if I do a dot title, that prints out the capitalized, first letter capitalized version of the same string. Now I have a method called split. a dot split splits the string a and in brackets have specified comma. So it will basically split it into three parts where the comma becomes the delimiter uh, for the three substrings. In this case, it will break it up into three parts because there are, notice that there are two commas in the string. Uh, uh, there's one here and there is one here. 
and therefore it's going to split it up into three separate entities i am a string i am an object i am immutable each one of them is single quoted uh, to indicate that it's actually a a string and you notice that it's enclosed by these square brackets and that's because these the the output of a dot split uh, operation is what is called as a list we will encounter lists in the in the next lecture then there is a method called a dot strip it what it does it removes all the trailing and leading white spaces so I, you can see that there is some empty space here and there is some empty space at the end but the strip operation uh, removes the trailing and leading white spaces another thing to remember is that strings are immutable immutable means their value value of elements of the string cannot be changed okay so you can print the a you can do a dot title like we did uh, if you print a uh, it doesn't change so what did we do we first printed the value of a uh, which is what we had set it then we said uh, you convert it uh, you do a dot title so convert it into this first letter capital but then if I print A again, A itself has not changed, right? But what it does, this particular line of code, what it does is that it returns, it gives back to you a, another string which you can store in another variable like B. So B is, if you do B is equal to A dot title and then you print B, you will get the capitalized version uh, of the string A, right? So the string A itself cannot be changed. Now, if I try to do something like this, A3 is equal to X. So what I wanted to do is, uh, this is the zeroth character, actually there are spaces here, zero, one, two, three. Uh, if I wanted to change the letter I to X, and I try to do it like this, a square bracket three is equal to X, it fails, it gives me an error, right? And it tells me what is object. String object does not support item assignment, but perhaps more usefully, what that means is uh, immutability implies that you can't do in place modifications to a string. If you wanted to get help uh, on all the methods that are available for a given string, uh, just like we did uh, print their math and got help on the math module, if I do print their A and now my program knows that A is a string, it will give you all the methods that are available on the string. So like, for example, is al num, is it an alphanumeric string? Is alpha means, is it a alphabetical string? Is it a consisting only of digits? Is digit and so on. So there are many, many functions here that you can use to operate on the string. If you want to actually get help on any function uh, that applies to an object. So from here, we figured out, let's say that find is a method that is applicable for strings. So if I do help a dot find, it gives me a short description of what this thing does. So basically it returns the first, the lowest index in the string S where the substring sub is found, <coughs> okay? Uh, and it gives you the thing and it returns minus one on failure. So suppose you're looking for a string, a substring within a larger string and if it doesn't exist, it returns minus one. Okay, so at this point, I am going to, uh, uh, 
jump out of uh, my presentation and show you in about five minutes how a Python notebook uh, works and how it is to be used. Okay, so here I've already uh, started my uh, Python notebook. Okay, but I'm just going to show you the command, highlight the command uh, which I used. So it's very simple on my Linux machine and it's very similar whether you're using Windows or Mac OS 10. You just, if you have Jupyter installed correctly, if you type Jupyter notebook lec2.ipnd. So this is my IPython notebook, which I use to prepare all the slides for my lecture. If I just type that, then the Jupyter notebook will open in a browser window. Okay, and uh, this is where it is. Okay, so again here, if any of you are familiar with Mathematica notebooks, you'll you'll see the analogy uh, quite clearly. So what it, this has done? So let us now maximize this, or even uh, take it to full screen. So this I'm now running is a window that is running inside the browser, right? And what does it allow me to do? There are many options here. We are not going to go through all of them, but I'm just going to show you the, what you can do. So for example, if I wanted uh, to change the text here, I simply click here and notice here that this is shown as markdown. Okay, that is a way of specifying text uh, and how it is to be represented on the slide. So if I wanted to change this like lecture to second lecture of the course, right? And if I do control and enter, then it will show me approximately what it will look like on the slide. Right? Now, these are, of course, marked down. This is just information that we have in the slide. If I click on this particular cell, then uh, see here that things have changed from markdown to code. So this tells you that this particular cell is actually code, which is to be executed. So for example, if I do control enter here, it will print out the values. So now if I change this uh, A to two, let's say, right? And I do a control enter, uh, watch out what how the numbers here change. So the numbers, uh, these numbers have changed. These numbers have all changed because I've changed the, uh, the code here. So when I said, I urge you to go and look at the code and modify it, this is the sort of change that I want you to make. I want you to open the notebook uh, on Jupyter, and then I want you to go and edit the, the files. Okay. Now again, all of these cells, we've seen all of these slides on dynamic typing and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, if you make any changes at the end, you should save and checkpoint. By default, it tries to save automatically, uh, every few minutes, but if you want to save the code, you simply click on this save icon over here and you can edit, cut and so on. Uh, notice here that uh, Python 3 is being used. So by default, uh, Jupyter uh, notebook reads in the notebook, realizes that this is a Python 3 notebook and uses the Python 3 kernel for processing it. Uh, not trusted uh, is uh, uh, is uh, something that is used for authenticating whether a notebook is genuine and so on. But since we are not doing any authentication, this will always be not, not trusted. Uh, uh, kernels uh, uh, menu is here. The cell menu is probably what you want to do. So if you want to run all the code in my program, I would simply say run all and what will happen is everything will will uh, will run okay uh, there are parts of this uh, thing which i have not uh, covered uh, in the talk today due to paucity of time 
but everything that we uh, uh, that we are going to discuss that we discussed in this uh, class is all there in the form of the notebook uh, which will be uh, made available to you almost immediately uh, uh, through the moodle platform i urge you to take the time to uh, go through the no notebook uh, try to get it running and please post on the moodle platform uh, uh, if you have any difficulties. If we don't hear from you, I assume that you'll be able to open the notebook and you've been able to run it and you've been able to modify it. Okay. Uh, please don't be uh, scared to make changes. At the most, you will get an error uh, and uh, that's it. But you can change anything you want. I mean, if you want this 23 raised to 100, if I do 23 raised to 200 and do a control enter, it uh, instantly prints out the uh, answer for me. So all of this is available to you. You can make whatever changes you want uh, into the code. Uh, you want to change this 45 to 60 degrees, uh, no problem. It will change it here, but it doesn't change here. If you want to change this here as well, again, no problem. It'll, it'll print out the value. Uh, so I think I will uh, stop here. And like uh, the first lecture, we can take a few minutes uh, to answer questions. And uh, then we will break. Thank you. Sir, in the example, we have A equal to uh, Python rocks, which is the which is a string. And uh, so I understand A is of string type. So, yes. Yeah. Now, when we say A of 0, A of 1, yes. A of 2, like that, then it's a, a string array. Yes. Yeah. So in, in that sense, uh, should oh, I... It's a slice of a string. Yes. OK. So uh, can I treat A as a, I mean, uh, should I treat A as a string variable or uh, a slice of array, sir? It's an array uh, where string array is my question. Yeah, it's, uh, you should uh, leave behind the concept that you have of a string array that you may have in C and other languages. Okay. In Python, a string is just a sequence. Okay. Okay. Don't think of it as uh, as a uh, as a single object. Think okay. of it as a sequence of characters. Okay. Yeah. So, so there is no really equivalent of string array in Python. Okay. Okay. So suppose if I if I want to so uh, here I think. If you finish speaking, please uh, mute yourself immediately. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead, Krishnamurti. Uh, uh, yes, yeah, sir. So uh, when, when I'm uh, creating an array of uh, string, like as you said, uh, the string, I mean, any variable, it, uh, Python will assume uh, what we are going to type against it. So suppose uh, if I if I want to create an array in array variable in Python, then how do I do that, sir? I will talk about uh, arrays or lists in the next lecture. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. But I've lost his question. We are, we're seeing a lot of disturbance. Yeah. Uh, everybody who's not actively asking the question, please mute yourself because there's a lot of feedback going around. Prem Vijay is asking whether this is available in YouTube for those who didn't got Zoom access. The answer is yes. Uh, we will have uh, a few days delay in putting it on YouTube, but every lecture uh, even in, and the additional material, the slides, etc., uh, will be uh, the lectures will be put on YouTube and the slides will be put on the uh, NRC website. So you'll hear more about it uh, uh, tomorrow. And we have a list of people who tried to register for the course and uh, were not selected. We will be sending out uh, emails to them uh, uh, when the first video becomes available so they can periodically check back for uh, more, video, more videos.
So this is already answered by uh, Prakash. Uh, do we need uh, uh, do we need to access libraries to work with mathematical operators? Uh, I don't know what you mean exactly, but there are a lot of modules and packages that uh, will need to be uh, installed. The simple math operations that I showed you today uh, doesn't require the math module is always built in into Python. Uh, when you install Python, it's automatically available. Uh, so for the basic stuff that I'm showing today, uh, you don't need it. Okay. You can also use Google Colab. Uh, my notebooks should work uh, in Google Colab. Uh, can we get the course material? As I said, we are going to share with you uh, uh, the course material and uh, we'll share you an email once it becomes, uh, as and when it becomes available. Uh, the video recording of the first class are, uh, are probably going to be ready by tomorrow and will be available on YouTube. So while slicing space is also considered, yes, that's absolutely right. Uh, space is considered as a element of that sequence. So just Python rocks has that space in between. Uh, that is part of, is also considered. Uh, if you kindly share the Python script of the lecture day at the start of each class, it may help in better understanding the lecture. I would uh, not agree with that because if I share too much material with you, then instead of paying attention in the class, you will be distracted trying to read the uh, Python script. Uh, Kishale says the method title of the string object will return the same result as calling the object itself on the terminal. That is correct. How to split the string at any desired uh, locations then splitting only at comma. You will have to specify some kind of delimiter. Okay, so you can have use space as a delimiter. You can use some other letter, whatever you want as a delimiter and specify that in place of the comma and then you can split it. If you want to split it with uh, at specific, like if you want to substring it with 10 uh, characters per substring, that also can be done, but not with the split command. Yeah. Uh, can you please explain the operation A col 1 colon 6 minus 1? Uh, what that means is start with the first uh, A1 uh, object, go up to A6 but go it, do it in the reverse order. That's the idea between A1 colon 6 minus 1. Quick question, where are the Jupyter notebooks? I may not have heard. So, so we'll share the Jupyter notebooks with you. Remember, this is the first lecture in which Jupyter notebooks have been used. So I'm going to uh, email them immediately to Prakash and we'll have them by tomorrow morning on the Moodle platform and uh, also hopefully very quickly on the, uh, on the website as well. Uh, for using nested function, uh, do we have to write math module? Yes, so you don't have to write the math module, but you have to say math dot sign or math dot radians, whatever you want, because you must specify exactly where that function is uh, coming from. How, how can we defer SciPy and NumPy? I will come to that in a future lecture. I'm not going to talk about it now. Uh, so Manish had this interesting question about what's the difference between an object and a module. See, a module is like, like a function. And within a module, you can have multiple objects in a module. So for example, in a math module, uh, you may have a sine function or a cos function and that may operate on different objects. Okay, in the DIR, this is an interesting question uh, from Gajanan Harale. In the DIR, there are some functions like underscore something underscore. These are what are called hidden functions or internal functions. While writing your code, you are not supposed to use these uh, functions. So I strongly urge you at least until you become really proficient, you just forget about all functions listed there that have underscores that start with a underscore. 
Uh, is all of Python zero indexed? Answer is yes. So it's like C and unlike Fortran, it is zero index. Uh, can you please re-explain how to open the script in Jupyter Notebook? So I'll, I'll just show you that. So to open the script, I just type this command, Jupyter space notebook slash space and the name of the uh, IPython notebook file, uh, IPYNB, which is lec2.ipynb. This is the file that I'll be sharing with you. Once you have that, save it in a directory and then type Jupyter notebook lec2.ipython notebook. Uh, last question here from Kishale is that we could still choose to practice on our terminal or an ID of our choice, right? Is it compulsory to use Jupyter? Uh, no, uh, of course not. If you are uh, happy with uh, any other ID, please uh, import the IPython notebook in there. What I can also do is that I can share in addition to the file in the IPython notebook format, uh, I'll also share it as directly as a .py uh, format. So you can then import it trivially into any ID. Uh, interpreted and compiled languages. What interpreted languages do is that they run the code line by line. Compiled language uh, takes the entire program runs it through a compiler and creates, uh, do, does the compilation process and the linking process and creates an executable, uh, which is where the source code doesn't exist as source code anymore. Uh, it can just be executed. So that's what a uh, compiled language does. So that's the main difference. Uh, we don't have to care too much about it because Python is essentially fundamentally an interpreted language. Uh, and once, so long as you remember that and remember that it's, there's no need for compilation, you just take your source code and uh, run it, uh, that's all.